Good afternoon and welcome to this Your Active Online event, which is kindly supported by Dan Foss. I'm Frédéric Simon, the Energy and Environment Editor of Your Active, and I will be your host for today's event titled Sector Integration, How Can the EU Best Create and Leverage an Integrated Energy System? So why are we discussing this topic today? Well, in July last year, the European Commission put forward a strategy for energy system integration with the aim of creating a more efficient energy system, bringing together energy carriers like electricity or gas with end use sectors like buildings, transport and industry. And the end objective is to bring more renewables to the energy system and ultimately accelerate the transition to clean energy by using energy sources where they can make the biggest difference in terms of decarbonization. Now, of course, the main question now is how the strategy will be implemented in practice and how it relates with the hydrogen strategy that was presented at the same time and which is closely linked to, ener to the energy system integration. <clears throat> so to discuss these topics today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Guido Bortoni, Senior Advisor on Energy System Integration at the European Commission's DG Energy, Morten Pedersen, a Danish MEP who is also Vice Chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Energy and Industry, Lisa Fischer uh, from the E3G Climate Think Tank in London, Paul Voss, Managing Director of Euroheat and Power, and Jurgen Fischer, President of Danfoss Climate Solutions. Uh, welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. We'll start this virtual conference with some short opening statements from the speakers, and then we'll turn to a Q&A uh, session moderated by me that will also include questions from the audience. To ask a question, just click on the Ask button on Vimeo, and I will try um, and take as many of these questions as possible. Um, I think that's all for me. So Guido Bortoni, the floor is yours now. Yes, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Many thanks for the invitation to debate upon such a key topic in energy. We already had in the past many unions initiatives in the energy field to implement a number of integration processes under different aspects. Nowadays, we have in front of us a very special integration driven by the EC's energy system integration strategy an extraordinary integration throughout the deep transformation of the energy system. Let me underline the need of having an IES and its very concept as the energy flagship under the European Green Deal, of course. Today's energy system in EU are organized in a silos manner, connecting at the upstream level each energy source with its relevant downstream, the final use. Almost no link among silos sectors are established and no clear distinction among sources, carriers and fuels exists. Just an example, natural gas is at the same time, all of them, electricity, a carrier, hydrogen, now a feedstock, a fuel and a carrier may be to come. This overall structure of separate silos with its inter-barriers cannot deliver a climate neutral economy. In particular, it is not capable to spread across the entire economy and society. First, the decarbonization of energy and final uses coming from the most decarbonized vectors also towards the hardest to abate sectors. And second, it lacks efficiency because the segmented markets are less efficient than a wide market platform under a full IES. Only a transformation of such a model by demolishing undue barriers and turning it into an integrated energy system whereby decarbonization and market, my fluid, can achieve an effective, affordable and deep decarbonization of the economy. The creation of AIS by using and innovating technologies will, for the EU, also contribute to jobs and growth, security of supply and global industrial leadership, as stated by the Green Deal. Those are the main leverages of the EIS, IES is introducing. 
Finally, such a profound change of the energy context could only happen whether the multi-speed transformations of energy value chains goes hands in hands with overall acceleration in decarbonizing and making efficient the transition to withstand to the ambitions at 2030 and the net zero emission at 2050 in Europe. Thank you. So let me turn now to Morden Pedersen. Thank you, uh, Frederick, and, uh, and, and thanks for setting this up. Uh, I think that the topic is uh, of, of tremendous uh, importance, and I can uh, subscribe wholly and fully to what uh, Guido uh, just said uh, in terms of, of breaking down silos and, 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 and the need to, for, uh, for doing this. because. I, I think, roughly speaking, if, if we are to fulfill our climate targets, be it 2030 or, or, or 2050, uh, sector coupling is, is, is the next uh, thing to do. Uh, simply put, we will not fulfill these ambitions uh, and ambitions if we not, do not get it right in, in, in ensuring that we, we couple uh, sectors. I, I think one of the big questions for the debate today is, is, is then what? Because I think we would all agree on, on the necessity of, of, of doing this. Uh, the hard part is, 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 is then what? What is it that we actually supposed to legislate upon, apart from uh, the, uh, the, the targets and, and, and also some of the sectoral uh, ambitions? And I think we have to discuss among ourselves if, if uh, or how we can find new ways of, of collaboration. Uh, that could be between the public and, and private entities. Uh, it could be uh, between all the various layers of, of government, be it national and, and supranational as the EU level, but also on, on, uh, on a local level. Uh, so we have to sort of make some shortcuts in this in order to find new ways of collaborating across sectors, but also within a governmental or local or, or regional uh, systems, because uh, as, as Guido rightly pointed out, I mean, we have to move across silos if we are to go further. And I foresee that we will have the need to pinpoint also the obstacles in doing so. And that could be taxation, that could be very tricky legal matters, uh, even on a membership, uh, sorry, member state level or at EU level. So, all this to say that I think uh, one of the uh, things that I would like to, to discuss further today is also to pinpoint what are the obstacles in order to achieve this sector coupling that I think we can all agree on uh, on an overall and, and general level. Thank you so much uh, for the floor. I'm looking so much forward to, to the discussion today. Thank you, Frederick. Thanks, Morden. And so let me turn now to Lisa Fisher. Thanks very much, Frederick and Guido and Morten. Thanks for your contributions as well. And uh, it looks like it's a sunny day across uh, Europe, including the UK here. Um, um, so, um, Perhaps I'm, I'm following on very nicely from, from Morton's contribution. Um, the, the main point I wanted to make today is around sector coupling or energy system integration is really more uh, than just, or happens through more than just uh, technology. Um, and it's that we, if we want to do it properly, and I think we all agree on the benefits, we can delve into that more in detail if, later if we want to. But if we want to do, do it properly, we really need to look deep into our um, energy um, toolkit, dust it off, have a, have a close look and probably rid ourselves of a few uh, uh, tools and, and upgrade others. And just, uh, I wanted to give you three sort of buckets of examples um, on where uh, we might need to have a close look. The first one is around how we make decisions around um, our infrastructure out there. Um, if we look at what we're doing on, um, um, cross-border infrastructure at the moment, um, we're 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 treating uh, gas and electricity very much apart. We're trying to integrate them a little bit more, but we're also very importantly treating the demand side, so energy efficiency and uh, demand side flexibility as an external thing to our uh, uh, infrastructure choices. Um, thinking of ten-year network development plans here, so this is really something that we we need to change and we need to bring in the expertise from across supply side, demand side, from across the energy sectors uh, at, at equal level um, in order to do the infrastructure planning well here. 
Another one around infrastructure planning is a, a tool that we've been using in the past, which is uh, the, the metric of security of supply it really no longer works in this new context where we have a range of different energy solutions available and, and not only on the supply side and where we should be measuring it on a on a vector by vector basis. So another one to really dust off, uh, look at it closely and either either reform fundamentally or, 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 or drop the metric as it stands at the moment. The second bucket is around um, financing our infrastructure and modern has alluded to taxation, which I think is important, but one example I wanted to get give is around how our regulated asset base model and 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 how we refinance and uh, infrastructure and how we give certainty around uh, uh, infrastructure finance. Again, it's 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 a it's a useful tool. It's very much focused on supply side at the moment. Um, the analysis is very much on a vector vector basis. Um, we should be treating our building stock as something a key infrastructure that we can that we can make more efficient and increase energy security through it, that we can uh, make more, more flexible and, and, and through that remove the need for, um, for example, thermal backup generation. And we, we should be thinking of tools like regulated asset base in, in that context as well, if, if we're serious about energy system integration. And then the last bucket around um, market design. I mean, later this year, um, the commission will be proposing a, a gas package. I'm wondering, do we really need to frame it as such? Isn't isn't the real challenge, um, um, for example, decarbonizing heat, industrial and residential heat? And what we want is to be deploying all the tools we have at hand from, from the gas side of things, from the electricity side of things, uh, from the demand side of things, a uh, digital, to be meeting uh, and rising to that challenge. And, and can that help us with more competition and efficiency? and delivering uh, our climate goes at lower cost instead of continuing to frame the conversation on a vector by vector basis. And, and similarly, um, I think, you know, when we think about um, um, important, important um, new solutions like hydrogen, um, but that are scarce and that are really a premium solution, we need mechanisms that can allocate them where, where they add most value um, in the energy system. At the moment, we don't have that. And by, by, by not addressing that, we risk blending this into the energy system as a whole and, and sort of reducing the value um, of that resource. So again, that's, that goes back to sort of, we need to think about the tools and, and planning processes and, and decision-making processes as much as we need to think about uh, technology here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, let me turn now to Paul Voss. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, Frederick. Um, so I come from the district heating sector and sector integration is pretty old news to us. Um, when I started with this industry, it's, God, it's nearly 10 years ago. Um, one of the things that I discovered was that you can use heat networks to provide storage and balancing services that help with the integration of renewable electricity into the grid. And when I started working on this in Brussels, I quickly learned that if you want to get the attention of the broader policy community, uh, it's best to tie your subject in one way or another to electricity, because this has certainly had people's uh, attention and, and captured people's imagination in the last years. Uh, we began to do that, and it, it helped bring district heating into the, the European policy debate. Then when sector integration emerged as a, as a key theme of the new commission, we were really encouraged. Um, but I, I then began to realize that different people naturally have different understandings of what's meant by sector integration, and that initially, anyway, it seemed for a lot of people, sector integration meant combining gas and electricity in, in one way or another, uh, whereas we would tend to see it more broadly. Um, and I still hear a lot of talk about electrons versus molecules, and that quite quickly um, narrows to a discussion about gas and or electricity, when obviously there, there, there's a wider subject at stake here. But to be fair to the commission, I think that the paper that came out last summer was was really outstanding. Uh, and from the district heating sector's point of view, pointed to a number of important issues for us. One is power to heat, so that when there's surplus wind electricity, um, you can channel that 
when there's no market for it, you can channel that into large heat pumps or other electrical production and, and store that energy as heat and supply your district heating with it, which allows more flexibility to, to the grid and also a decarbonized heat solution. Um, the paper is really good on waste heat, which is emerging as an important theme in, in Brussels now. How do we take waste heat from our factories or data centers and use it in, in nearby buildings rather than simply uh, getting rid of it? Um, this notion of, of green gas of one type or another, particularly hydrogen, um, we see hydrogen production as an important source of, of waste heat actually for our networks. And also to some extent, uh, it may well help um, providing a certain amount of fuel because I think we'll probably need some hydrogen-based CHP to balance the grid. And of course that can be supplied to uh, the district heating network. I'd agree with what Lisa said. It's so important when we're gonna have hydrogen, particularly renewable hydrogen, which is a, prayer, a, a scarce and precious resource to use it thoughtfully and use it for the applications to which it's best suited. Um, and, and finally, I think the, the commission paper does an important thing in, in making district heating part of the European energy infrastructure discussion. So whereas perhaps previously it might have been treated as a purely local issue, uh, now because of the links to gas and electricity, it emerges as um, a matter of strategic interest at, at European level and calls in the paper for better um, cooperation, deeper cooperation between, for example, TSOs, DSOs, and heat network operators. Um, that's that's really encouraging. Uh, I think the, the most, uh, probably what I like best about the paper is at the end when it talks about um, district heating being one of the sectors where Europe has global leadership. I think um, it's it's true. I mean, my own experience of, of, of working in a, in a Danish company prior to this, Danfoss, who I believe is with us today, um, the rest of the world comes to Europe to learn about sustainable heating and cooling networks. And, and that's great. And that's something we should cherish and value. It means that we can export know-how and products to the rest of the world and bring jobs and and uh, and opportunities back, back here to Europe. So I'm really encouraged by the paper. I'm really encouraged by the ongoing EU level discussion on sector integration. Now comes the interesting bit, and I'll leave that for the discussion about how we translate these principles into practice through legislation. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Paul. And indeed, uh, we'll have a discussion uh, very soon about, about that, uh, precisely how to translate this now into practice. Uh, but before we go into further detail on that, let me turn to our last speaker, and that is Junger Fischer from Danfoss. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm the head of Danfoss Climate Solutions, and as the name is saying, we are dealing with climate solutions in the future. Eating, our, eating the medicine ourselves, so in what we are doing and how we are doing it is basically the same. Uh, adding to Paul's point, who stole a couple of my points, of course, um, I think uh, we will all in the future have an energy system which is based on renewables. And only if there is an absolute need will we use fossil fuels for applications you can not yet maybe create by using renewable energy. In order to do that, we need enough uh, energy efficiency in whatever we are doing in order to uh, save the energy because energy we are saving, we don't have to produce, we don't have to transport and we don't have to store. All these three areas are actually causing an effort. Uh, even, even production is not the only one, it's also transportation and, and energy storage. Uh, in order to do that, we need to be as efficient as we can be on the demand side. Uh, in using on a local level, on a regional level, uh, complete energy systems. Um, so we basically merge uh, heating, cooling buildings, industrial applications, transport, and so on and so on. Um, we have a lot of good examples doing that, for example, in uh, supermarkets where you can use the excess heat, which is produced by cooling food uh, in order to heat uh, yeah, close by uh, living areas. We have uh, good examples also in Denmark where we're using heat pump to increase waste heat from factories. A very good example I'm totally uh, close to is our factory in Nordborg, where we'll be uh, very soon completely CO2 neutral in, uh, in, in our heating. And at the same time, we reduce the cost uh, for heating for the uh, for the small village close by by 50% because we use the waste heat from the ventilation of our factories, which so far is just going up into the, into the air and it's increasing our CO2 balance. At the same time, I think it's important that we uh, 
not just use waste heat, but we plan it that way. So where to put a data center in the future? Ideally, you put it close to a consumer, you put it close to a new living area. And there is many examples of that happening at the moment. At the same time, it will become cheaper. Um, and that means the commercial adaptation will be much faster. If we have to base that on, on subsidies and, and complicated rules, it will take a long time in my opinion. Last but not least, I think uh, it's important that we uh, support that by the right legislation. Give you an example here from the city I live in Hamburg. As of July 1st, if you replace your heating, you can uh, you can only do that if you have 20% renewable uh, in that uh, in that heating solution. So you cannot replace it with a gas heating. You'd at least to have uh, solar thermal application or solar panels on the roof. And uh, now there is a boom at the moment. Everybody wants to replace its heating with a pure gas heating because that's cheaper. And that is actually showing you that people will only act on commercial pressure and uh, the better we embed that into an incentive the faster we will change it okay thank you Jürgen Fischer um, and I'll stay with you uh, now uh, for a bit uh, for the beginning of uh, the Q&A session and basically I'll be putting a very uh, basic question to all of you uh, what do you think are the main barriers to sector integration? Um, and what do you think was the main value added of the European Commission sector integration strategy that was presented last year in this respect? Jürgen Fischer. Yeah, I think the main barrier is exactly what's, what's mentioned by a couple of our speakers here, that uh, the systems are not connected today. They are in a silo and there is no incentive for the different areas to, uh, to act together. As a, as a technology company, we quite often look at the complete energy system. But if we then want to make a case out of that, we need to talk to the producer, the network company, uh, the investor, the planner, the contractor, and finally, uh, maybe maybe the final user. And that is super complicated to create a good compelling case, uh, which is then uh, yeah, increasing the value of the first time costs uh, uh, towards the, uh, uh, the, the running cost. And that's actually a big problem. So if we succeed in doing that, uh, bringing the different levels uh, together, I think we will have a very, have very fast uh, adaptation. How can those links be created then, uh, Jürgen Fischer, very, very briefly, in your view? I think, by, of course, by legislation, but in my opinion, really by, by uh, yeah, uh, education of the right people, public servants um, as well, uh, contractors, installers, everybody in the industry, and the part of, of that we are doing today. Uh, I think we need to increase our presence wherever we are, where we can influence people. Um, I think we need also to work on the, on the necessary norms uh, and uh, building codes because uh, in, in, to my knowledge and in my daily practice, what is being built today is still living from a denorm from 2015 and 16. So any kind of innovation coming up will take years until it arrives at the final construction. So speed up in norms. Um, and last but not least, I think we need to push a lot as a service models, where then companies, investors, technology companies, uh, utilities, and so on, are merging into an as a service provider, uh, because only companies who understand the whole system can, in my opinion, uh, um, uh, release the value of an integrated system. Okay, thanks, Jürgen Fischer. Uh, let me turn now to Paul Voss. Um, uh, very briefly, from from your side, what do you think are the main barriers to sector integration, um, and the and the and the added value that the European Commission strategy brought last year? I think um, fu fundamentally, what what needs um, a, a precondition for, for for getting this done is a kind of culture of cooperations that hasn't existed traditionally and that can mean across industries across different sectors but even across you know business units with within a single company people simply haven't been trained to think this way they haven't been trained to work this way and they're not incentivized to work this way i think that's 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 uh, what what jürgen was getting at and and i think you solve that problem by by normalizing it by changing the the mindset and in that sense i i, I hope that this initial um, policy paper and the forthcoming legislation from the commission can can help to do that can help to make this um standard practice in the way that that people approach 
the energy system and their and their place within it in the future. You know, I hope that in 10 years, we don't even need to discuss this because it's just part of the fabric of the way that we, we do things. I was approached by, uh, some of you might know Laurent Schmidt, who until quite recently was the CEO at NSOE. Transmission system operators, and he grabbed me by the arm at an event uh, sometime last year, and said, "We have to talk." And, and that was really an important moment because we we hadn't talked previously, and then we started to. And now, the district heating industry and the TSOs are in a constant dialogue about how heat networks can fit in and, and shape the um, ten-year network development plan. So, become part of this infrastructure puzzle. We have to talk to each other, to put it simply. Hey, Lisa Fisher, uh, your views um, about the main barriers to sector integration and the and the value that the Commission's strategy brought um, in your view. Yeah, I'm going to pick up a point from that I made earlier around um, really the, the the governance of how we make decisions. I think um, that the um, you know we can we can no longer afford to make energy decisions on a supply side basis, vector by vector. We really have to look at the system across the board, and I think the the strategy really identified that. We have seen some early signs that the, the revised 10E regulation is picking some of that up, even though it doesn't go all the way in, in, in terms of uh, integrating the, the demand side and putting more in, independence at the heart yet. So that's that's one to watch. I think just to spin this a little bit further, I think that what really em what this really emphasizes for me, and Paul, you, you alluded to that, is the incredible role uh, you know, local governments have in planning going forward, because this is where all these different perspectives come together, where district heating plays a role, where you know aspects like highlighted on using capturing waste heat from uh, cooling from supermarkets, all this comes into play. And I'm working with a, a number of cities across Europe who uh, that are trying to uh, design fossil free uh, energy systems and 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 they are really struggling because they need to make very, very important decisions now about the future of their district heating system, the future of their uh, gas networks and so on. They are under a lot of pressure, but they want to know whether um, you know, the decisions they make are setting them up for stranded assets or not. Um, and so I think the, the, the role of local planning, but also the role of the, of the European level in sort of putting up um, safeguards, guardrails around you know what will work in the future. What 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 is compatible with net zero? What is not compatible with net zero? I think that's really something where where we can kind of spin this governance element a little bit further and 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 um, deepen our thinking a little bit. Okay, um, Morden Pedersen, um, you expressed um, appetite to have a discussion about the barriers to sector integration. So, what, in your view? Um, are those and how can they be overcome? So uh, just to, to uh, add to what, what Lisa just said, um, uh, I visited a, uh, a project in, in the northern parts of Denmark uh, two weeks ago. Uh, uh, they call themselves a, a green lab. Uh, and essentially this is a sector coupling project trying to combine biomass, uh, waste heat, uh, renewable electricity generation, uh, what have you, all doing all the right things. I mean, and, 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 and they are experimenting and trying to scale up uh, and, and, and cross cutting all the various energy domains. So exciting, so interesting. And hearing these guys telling me about uh, the regulatory challenges that they were met with in a Danish context, that is, uh, having to navigate through all the layers of government, local level, uh, regional level, uh, and then at state level. Uh, I mean, that was just an, an amazing eye-opener as to the difficulties inherent in this if we are to go uh, or, or move across silos. So their point was that, and, and bear in mind, this is just a, a Danish example. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't even dare to think the complications on a European level, which is... Uh, you know, uh, uh, another uh, kind of discussion, but just to say that they would have to pinpoint in each and every time, okay, so what are the barriers, what are the obstacles in terms of taxation, in terms of permitting, in terms of uh, what have you, all these kind of, I mean, a Kafkaesque kind of situation where they want to do the right things, but there are so many obstacles in terms of legislation. 
And this is on a national level. So my big question is, uh, adding to this, do we have a cross-border dimension that we have to factor in and take into account? I believe there is. Uh, I'm working myself on a lot of offshore uh, renewable energy right now and, and how to integrate this in, in district heating, say, or uh, obviously electrifying the, the entire society is, 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 is obviously uh, a sector coupling uh, exercise uh, as well. So I think we, we have a gigantic task in order to identify the very specific areas of legislation that we have to avoid, that we even might have to address in taking out, so to speak. So you could you could call it a kind of political CCS or, or, or whatever, uh, that we have to identify, that we have to pick up in order to ensure that we can work together uh, across sectorial and, and, and break down the silence. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Morten Pedersen. So let me turn now to uh, the European Commission and uh, Guido Bortoni about how the strategy uh, now will be implemented in practice, because this is the question that we're all asking ourselves. We have a nice strategy on the table. Uh, Paul Voss said, you know, all the good that he thinks about it. But now, obviously, it needs to be implemented. A strategy is only a strategy. Um, but now there needs to be uh, legislation following. Um, and there's a package coming up uh, uh, in June. So can you tell us more, Guido Bortoni, um, what are the Commission's plans there uh, now to implement the energy sector integration strategy? Yeah, mm, let's say this strategy is, a, a, I think, is a very broad and good strategy, but of course uh, we have to implement it in, uh, in terms of legislation. But I am um, 100 percent uh, in agreement with Jürgen saying that the legislation is the most important piece of the of the of the pie, but it is not, let's say, sufficient. We have to legislate and we have also to empower uh, cons cons consumers, players and investors in uh, in this new culture of energy system uh, integration. Uh, I just uh, um, underline a point uh, because the system integration uh, at, the, at the very beginning of the European Green Deal started as smart integration. I'm sure every, everyone is remembering this. I would like to uh, underline a point of, uh, let's say, which kind of barriers we are facing uh, in, in, in by looking the, the, the smart sector integration from the domain viewpoint. Uh, let me describe how the consumer's point of view look like when comparing a siloed energy system as we have today and an IES according to the concept we have already commented on. In a silos, demand, uh, let's say the demand suffers from a double lock-in, in, in my point of view. First lock-in, it has to rely on the swift or less swift decarbonization of its own vertical supply, be it fuel, be it carrier, which is leading to the transition process of the demand too. This is a typical silos. In, in a way of decarbonizing. Second, the second lock-in, it cannot, I mean the demand, cannot consider, consider any switch to more efficient technologies, no changing on appliances fleet because of the lock-in to vertical supply, even though more efficient fleet are available in the market. This is, let's say, the double lock-in, and then you can demolish it if you abandon your silos, but please do not embrace another silos again, if it is possible. You have to, let's say, switch to a new uh, idea of uh, dealing with your supply. I mean, always from the demand point of view and having a multi-directional system in which consumers play an active role in energy supply. I mean, vertically decentralized production units and customers contribute actively to overall balance and flex make flexible the system. Horizontally, exchanges of energy increasingly take place between consuming sectors. For instance, energy consumers exchanging heat, 
in smart district heating we heard about and cooling systems or feeding it the electricity they produce individually as a part of energy communities, for example. So it is really a, a, a change of culture. And then we have to legislate. And as you know, as you mentioned, Frederick, we are um, now, uh, let's say, preparing some uh, legislation, legislative proposal for June both on the revision of uh, the Renewable Energy Directive as well as the uh, Energy Efficiency Directive. But for the end of the year, we are also preparing uh, the gas decarbonization uh, package, which is also including the hydrogen. Just one final sentence on hydrogen, which is a very uh, important topic, but today is a non-existing system for the energy, from the energy point of view we have to build more or less from scratch this new vector, this new fuel, uh, because now, you know, hydrogen is just used as a feedstock. And in order to have it uh, developing as a new energy component, we have to think about in a very uh, new manner, this kind of uh, legislation for and regulation for hydrogen. Thank you, Guido uh, Bertoni. Uh, let me ask just a, a, a follow-up question uh, to you about the um, uh, the coming June package, and you mentioned also the gas decarbonization package uh, coming up later uh, in December. So uh, when the Commission actually comes down to actual legislation in these coming months, how will you make sure that the approach which was outlined in the sector integration strategy uh, is not lost and forgotten uh, along the way. Um, is, is there some sort of horizontal um, uh, planning and organization taking place in order to prioritize uh, sector integration through, throughout all these legislative proposals? Yeah, let me, um, to, to answer, let me recall the overall uh, logic of this uh, Fit for 55 package, because everything, the June proposals as well as the December or end of year proposal uh, will uh, be part of this uh, Fit for 55 package, as, as you know very well. Um, I think in this uh, 5th of 55 package, we have to um, propose a legislation which is a sort of mix in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, tools or logics which belong to, let's say, the carbon pricing. We have to exploit uh, uh, the, uh, the ETS system, but in, in this mix, we have also to prepare some uh, regulatory measures in order to combine and to be integrated in this, uh, let's say, mix with the carbon price, uh, carbon pricing uh, mechanism. And I think energy system integration measures will belong to the second family, the re I mean the regulatory measures we are, let's say, considering in this, uh, in this package. And so I think uh, the only um, challenge here is trying to find a very good mix in terms of these two families uh, of, of uh, let's say, uh, measures, one coming or using the ETS, spreading the signals of ETS across the, the energy system, as well as to use, let's say, some specific regulatory measures uh, in order to selectively uh, uh, support technologies for the decarbonization and for the efficiency of the overall energy system. Okay, thank you. Um, let me turn to Martin Pedersen now. Uh, your views about uh, the sector integration strategy and how it should be implemented in practice. Um, how will the European Parliament approach this uh, when it comes down to actual legislation in the months to come, Martin? Well, Frederick, this is clearly uh, one of the, the, the main challenges uh, that, that we 
we have because when uh, when dealing with and, and having to work with all the legislation coming up this year and very soon we'll have a, a tsunami of legislation in, in, in the European Parliament and in the various uh, committees and ensuring that that we have a, a systemic approach to this, a horizontal approach to this, and ensuring, by the way, consistency, that what we end up adopting in one specific file is not in contradiction to uh, what would happen in another file is, is a major challenge. So we have a, a real issue here in terms of governance, how to ensure consistency uh, across the the, uh, the entire spectrum. Again, I, I'm coming back to the basic fact that I think you'd see a lot of appreciation uh, towards sector coupling and, and, and systems integration. Uh, and the big difficulty is doing this uh, in, in, in practice and ensuring that that we have consistency uh, across all the various committees dealing with all these various topics. So this is going to be a, a big challenge in, in order to get the governance structure right. Uh, we're dealing with all the various uh, and, and, and specific files uh, on the table. So this is clearly something that we have to be very much aware of in, in the legislative uh, process. Thanks. Thank you, Morden. Uh, Lisa Fischer, uh, turning to you now, what are your views then on how to now implement the sector integration strategy? Uh, does do, do you think it requires some sort of special approach uh, when it comes to, um, well, actually several sectors taken individually, like buildings or transport, which are currently in silos. Um, what do you think should be the regulatory approach to uh, to, to all these sectors and implementing this strategy? Yeah, thanks. This is, of course, a really tra tricky question. And I think it's really important that we don't make the perfect the enemy of the good here. This will be a very complex undertaking i think the eu is really on the on the on the you know global leadership end here um so we won't get everything right but i think what we need to think about is um in terms of key questions is you know how how will we make decisions about our energy system in the future and that's a key thing that needs addressing and i'm not entirely sure it has a apart from the tenny regulation but which is a very specific context has a has a good home yet so that would be perhaps a question back to guido on on where he thinks that might 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 land land. And how do we monitor changes and where we may learn from failure, where we may want to uh, focus our innovation uh, efforts on like like key challenges of like last mile in a hundred percent renewable system um or, or or heavy duty transport. So how do we identify those key innovation areas? I think that's that's also a challenge out there that I don't think has a natural home yet in 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 how we um how we design the regulation. I think there's also something about that I mentioned earlier on how we frame um some of the key legislative proposals and um of course there's some path dependence. We have a renewables directive, let's keep a renewables directive, but do we actually need a gas package or can we frame it much more from from the challenge we're trying to tackle here? So really from decarbonizing heat and 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 then by through that we are actually opening our minds much more to towards creating a market where we where we um bring all energy solutions in and then um a last thing that i wanted to highlight where i think it's really important to focus our minds on and it it doesn't necessarily perhaps need a specific piece of legislation but um and it, it does need a lot of focus across all pieces is the question of uh, the consumers in, in, in the energy transition. So there's a huge benefit uh, to the consumer from energy system integration, potentially, because there are more options on the table, um, increased comfort through uh, energy efficiency, lower energy bills, and so on and so forth. However, uh, we have the challenge of um, we need to make sure that the, those choices are framed right uh, for the consumer, because in the first instance, not all consumers can afford all choices or have access because of their renting their homes and so on and so forth. So that's something to think about. I think I, I hope that the, the follow up to the renovation wave will, will be doing a lot of that, but but really supporting uh, consumers in, in the access to those choices. And, um, and, and, and then there are also choices that the consumer can't actually make. Right. If you are on the gas grid, you are on the gas grid and it's it's it's. Um, it shouldn't mean that the only solution you can choose is, is hydrogen. So, um, what we there's 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 
a few more regulatory guardrails that we need to think about in this context. I guess this is something that could be picked up by a heat decarbonization package, uh, potentially. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, let me turn to Paul Voss. Um, so your views on how the sector integration strategy can now be implemented uh, in practice. Uh, does it still make sense to look at some sectors individually, like heating, or um, how do you see that happening now when it comes to the actual legislation? Yeah, I think it's it's a nonsense to look at heating in isolation from electricity, for example. I mean, you 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 shouldn't do that, and you you can't do that if you're going to be serious about it. I mean, the the sector integration strategy talks about the commission's intention to accelerate investment in smart, efficient district heating, and there are a couple of ideas I'd like to pick up there. I mean, the first is, you know, how nice that that that's great that uh, the commission wants to accelerate investment, but they're quite specific when they say smart, efficient district heating, and there's a good reason for this. Um, probably in my job, I'm not really supposed to say this, but it's the truth. Not all district heating is good district heating, and we shouldn't just have more district heating. We need better district heating. There's kind of an implicit deal there. I think there's there's emerging policy support for heat networks. Um, the other side of the coin is that they need to become increasingly um, in line with the vision of the Green Deal, otherwise it would make much, much sense. And I, I hope the package can help move us in that direction with a combination of regulatory and financial support. Some of the important regulatory instruments that occur to me, I mean, there is a, call, a clause in the current Renewables Directive uh, encouraging cooperation, as I mentioned earlier, between electricity and heat operators. Um, but it's pretty gentle stuff that basically asks us to send each other a Christmas card every couple of years. I, I would hope to see that cooperation intensified and also broadened. You know, we need a much better dialogue with producers of, of waste heat, for example. Um, there's far too much of it that is just thrown away because the right people don't know each other or the planning was done in such a way that the installations haven't been put in the right places. So I, I hope that we see um, in the, the package, particularly in the renewables directive, more to encourage this type of, of cooperation. Um, I hope we see something done, uh, and I don't know in the end whether that's through energy taxation or an extension of the ETS, but I would like to see a CO2 price applied to heat all across the heating sector, uh, regardless. So right now, I mean, I, I've told this story before, some of you will be getting bored of it, but uh, our house in Brussels, we bought and renovated a couple of years ago, and it was, almost impossible to find an installer who would even talk to me about a solution other than a gas boiler. And when I finally did find one, he came to my house, told me it would cost 23,000 euros to install it. And when I asked him about the payback period, he laughed and said, you will spend more on the electricity than you ever would on the gas. And you know that's not really a heat pump problem. That's a regulatory problem. It, it shouldn't be. People need a price signal, and you can expect ordinary citizens to bravely spend, you know, ten times more than they they need to for their heat supply because it's the right thing to do. We need to change the boundary conditions so that people get the signal from the market to to do the right thing. Um, finally, I'd like to see a much bigger role for um, local authorities in all this. Now, I realize it's difficult to articulate this from a governance point of view it's it's difficult to establish obligations on local authorities or a role for local authorities at eu level but if we don't give local authorities cities and regional governments um, a greater voice in shaping the energy systems of their future particularly in the heating sector which does have an inherently local aspect to it um, we, we won't get this right because those are the people who understand the resources and the needs on the ground. So somehow um, they need to be brought into this and given agency to help shape the process. Okay, that's an interesting suggestion to uh, create an agency in charge of um, of um, of sector integration, but also probably more <laughs> on the on the local aspects. I I, I understand. Um, of um, um, of delegating and coordinating, is that is that what you meant, Paul? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't mean create an agency. I mean give agency or you know a, a role uh, influence to local authorities in helping shape this process. 
Okay, interesting. Uh, Jürgen Fischer, uh, your views now on how the sector integration strategy uh, should be implemented now um, in practice. Uh, does it still make sense, uh, in your view, to look at sectors individually, like buildings, transport? Is there still value in doing that? No, I don't think so. I think uh, Paul is exactly right. It's it's stupid to look at an individual uh, sector alone if you want to foster and uh, and boost um, uh, sector coupling. I think energy is energy, and at the at the end there is a lot of wind coming. The wind uh, contains a lot of energy. Already fifty percent are lost when you uh, when you uh, when it comes out of a windmill and then it's being transported. So at the end we need to use as much as possible from the natural energy and transform that into other types of energy. In here we are talking about thermal energy. We talk about heating, but also not to forget about cooling because the energy usage for cooling in the future will be significantly higher than the one for heating on a global scale. And also in Europe, I think you will, uh, with the global warming, uh, you will have more need for uh, for cooling because buildings are better insulated. They need a forced ventilation, and then you need cooling technology. And then you are back to the use of a heat pump because uh, a gas boiler can definitely not cool something, right? It can only heat. Another reason to use a heat pump. Uh, Paul also made a good point here, uh, we need to use new technology. The old district heating, uh, having an oil boiler, um, even in Hamburg half a city, which is uh, normally used as a good case for district heating, they have a big uh, gas boiler at the moment, right? They're now moving that over to using waste heat from Arubis, the biggest European uh, aluminium uh, plant here. Uh, this doesn't make too much sense, right? To, uh, to, to, burn, to burn gas and, and create heat. At the same time, on the, on the demand side, there is a lot of, uh, of control issues. So people usually opening the window uh, when it's getting too hot. So using smart software on the, on the supply side in order to forecast the demand at the same time using smart software on the supply side, forecasting the demand from, uh, from how many people are in that building, what is the weather looking like, is sun coming out. You can save 20, 30% energy by just using smart software in, the, in, a, in a given system. But all in all, um, adding to, my, to, my, uh, to the previous speakers here, I think we need an integrated energy market. Uh, we need the consumers of the energy talking to the producers in whatever way. Uh, if now through an agency or uh, uh, I, I, I have no uh, specific opinion to that. We need a CO2 price for all kind of energy, heating and cooling. Uh, only a good CO2 price can regulate that. If you, for example, use a heat pump, uh, then today uh, you pay a price for the electricity used by a heat pump. But if, for example, this heat pump is enabling waste heat from a supermarket, from a data center, from whatever, to be fed back into a district energy system, this negative CO2 price is not being subtracted from the positive price. So you need a kind of a, of, of a total system view uh, and to and otherwise you are punishing single elements of a system um, uh, and then it will never happen. And we need a better planning process. And um, I'm a strong fan of doing that locally, regionally, uh, cities, smaller cities, maybe maybe counties. That's the right level. And, uh, and Denmark, where, where I'm working most of my time, it's a very good example of, of integrated energy systems. Okay, let me ask a, a follow-up question um, to you, um, Jürgen, but maybe also to uh, to the others. Um, um, in, in the previous commission, we, we had a reform of the electricity market, um, and, and that was a bit contentious uh, at the time. Uh, now there's uh, another um, reform coming up of, of the gas market um, with um, you know a, a similar discussion now, um, which is about to take place. Um, when the Commission tables its proposals towards the end of the year. I mean, are we not there again seeing silos? The Commission is regulating the electricity market. Uh, later this year, it's going to regulate the gas market. Um, is the Commission taking its own lessons? Um, you know, it, it, it put forward this integration uh, strategy, but it still regulates in silos. What, what do you think about this, uh, Paul Voss? I think, first of all, that's up to the Commission in the end. I mean, it is probably true to say that in any large institution, um, one of the things that that you find is that there is a kind of there's an there's an inertia linked to the the architecture of the institution. So, uh, 
there, there will be large groups of people who traditionally have been responsible for organizing the gas market and another group of people who've been traditionally responsible for organizing the electricity market and so on and so on. And it, this is there's nothing specific to the European Commission there. It is the same in large companies. And the, the type of, uh, I mean, producing legislation, which is, let's say, the business of the, of the European Commission, um, that is inevitably, inevitably going to be shaped by that architecture. So I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the Commission in the sense that I expect that it, it will take time. And I mean, I see institutional reform going on inside the Commission now, and I don't doubt that that will be reflected. I mean, there is now, a, I don't know exactly what it's called, but there's effectively a sector integration unit now inside the European Commission, which I think would have been science fiction a few years ago. So in my view, it's rather normal that these changes take time and I do see things changing within the commission and I'm sure that in the coming years um, the commission will as a result produce a, a, a different type of proposal or at least I would expect so. Lisa Fisher maybe a few thoughts there in, in terms of how the, the European Commission still regulates in silos after all despite the system integration strategy that was presented last year. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'd agree with that, um, you know, we'd, um, you know, going for a gas package is probably not the design you would want to see in the context of energy system integration. I, um, as I said, I think we would want to much more focus on really the, the challenges and, and the objectives and the outcomes we want to achieve. So it's not about regulating the gas markets for gas market's sake any longer. There will be specifics that deserve that focused attention. But much more generally, we have that decarbonisation goal. We have that um, um, the broader Green Deal with its also social justice elements that we want to focus on. And so we need to start framing our regulation um, from, with those outcomes in mind and 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 um, focus on on the key key challenges beneath that, like heat decarbonisation, like getting a hundred percent renewables energy system. So I'd agree that you know in the ideal scenarios you'd reframe that. That is, of course, not easy for big institutions. I appreciate that too. Um, but I think it's important to focus minds on that at the moment. And we, a, a gas package that merely focuses on gas on gas competition, like we've had in the past, will no longer be enough. If we do that, this approach will not deliver our climate goals, but it will also not develop, um, uh, deliver best value for consumers because, um, I mean, different numbers have been cited. Another one is, you know, if you, if you do smart electrification right, you can um, save half of the thermal backup potential uh, to 2050. So it really also saves energy system costs. It, it delivers value to the consumers. But if we don't have the setup to make those choices, um, we're not in the right place. So I'd agree that we need to reframe the, um, the gas package. At the very least, we need to reframe some of the key metrics like security of supply. We need to um, redesign some of the, the, the mechanisms around governance and infrastructure decision making. So uh, Guido Bertoni, maybe a few thoughts uh, from you, uh, because the Commission will uh, eventually, towards the end of the year, uh, regulate um, on the gas market. So how, how will the Commission approach this differently uh, now? Um, and, you know, in, with respect to the sector integration strategy, uh, how will it approach the regulation of the gas market, which is coming up? Yeah, I think I have to, first of all, I have to underline one thing, which is already started in our, let's say, um, thinking on, in our process to propose a new legislation. Don't forget that the energy system integration is an integration of the demand side, first of all. Then we have, of course, to come up uh, along the value chain and then we will have also some, uh, let's say, new logic to couple the vectors, electricity, gas or gases should be, and uh, the heat, of course, and the heat and uh, heat, heating and cooling, of course. But first of all, the, the real news here is that we are integrating the, the, the demand. So you will see also in the recent uh, uh, 
um, open public consultation, which was published, uh, let's say, last uh, Friday on uh, gases and hydrogen regulation in, in, in view of the, of the end of the year uh, to, be, to, 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 to be tabled in, in a proposal, in a legislative proposal, you will see the, the new logic coming in, in the sense that, of course, we have to first to recognize that some final sectors will be fed by molecules also in 2030 and in 2050. So we cannot just say, okay, we, we can forget this kind of thing. So we have to regulate a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, molecule-based system, be it methane, methane-based system, I mean biomethane, etc., the rena renewable and low carbon gases, be it hydrogen, for example. So it is really the energy system integration logic. If you remember the first three pillars, let's say energy efficiency, the first one, the second one, electrification with the large quantity, large volumes of renewable energy, which is the main, let's say, pathway we are envisaging. And the third one is to have, let's say, a, 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 a a newly uh, conceived uh, molecule uh, sector or system which is uh, able to uh, decarbonize and to integrate uh, the many sectors of the demand which are always on on the, on the on the let's say always fed will be always feed with fed by uh, let's say the the, the 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 gas or hydrogen uh, supply so um, i in order to close i think that you will see this converging regulation uh, in in the in the month to come because we are first of all integrating the demand and of course we are going up to in, in along the, the value chain and then you will see a lot of uh, let's say uh, coupling points among vectors and, of course, their regulation. Okay, thank you, Guido Bertoni. Let me stay with you now to open um, um, a quick discussion on hydrogen because um, actually, um, and you touched upon that uh, uh, right now, Guido, um, uh, I mean, a lot of the sector integration strategy last year was um, finally put down to to hydrogen as as one way of bri building bridges between the electricity and gas sectors um, and in some ways the system integration strategy was boiled down to uh, to that to to hydrogen so how important is in fact hydrogen as part of sector integration has uh, the importance of hydrogen been overstated maybe uh, a little bit Guido Bertoni. Yeah. Yes, thanks for the question. As I, as I mentioned before, uh, we are dealing with hydrogen. We are uh, dealing with the non-existing system. I mean, in terms of a com as, as, as a component of the energy system as such. Of course, we today we have some uh, volumes of hydrogen, but they are mainly used as feedstock. We are trying to, um, to have a concept of hydrogen as the second, I should say, synthetic vector in the energy system. The first one being the electricity and the second one being hydrogen, of course. Uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, um, component or this kind of vector, hydrogen, I mean, is uh, really, really complementary uh, with respect to electricity, because if you look at the electricity, let's say, from a, a very external point of view, it suffers from three weaknesses. One is, let's say, um, it is, of course, is, is, is a scarce fuel in the sense that the electricity is has a, a very low density whenever you apply it for mobility uh, for mobility um, purposes second electricity is not participating in any combustion processes 
Third, uh, electricity uh, needs a lot of uh, storage because we are going into a world, as uh, some speakers said before, uh, in which we will have a lot of variable renewable energy sources to be integrated in the, in the power system. So if you look at these three uh, weakness points of electricity, being also the electricity, the main course, the main pathway of our, um, let's say, future in the, in the, in the energy system, uh, these three uh, weakness point, points could be complemented, could be compensated by hydrogen because it has strong points uh, in, in order to close these kind of uh, weaknesses coming from electricity. So it is a perfect merging, it is a perfect uh, combination between electricity and hydrogen to compensate for some weaknesses of the, the other sector. Okay, thanks, Guido Bertoni. Um, uh, let me turn to you, uh, Morten Pedersen, then, um, about the, the importance of hydrogen uh, for sector integration. Um, has it been overstated to some extent, um, uh, in your view, or is it one of those uh, indeed crucial, um, crucial things for, for sector integration? Uh, it is absolutely crucial. I, I wouldn't dare to... to... Uh, speculate as to whether now finally is the time for hydrogen. Uh, I mean, this has been said for for decades, I'd say, and and for sure there's a lot of, of hype around hydrogen, and 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 uh, it has extremely massive political attention uh, right now, and is considered to be more or less a solution to uh, to everything right now, politically speaking. So so there is a lot of fuss surrounding hydrogen and, and to which extent uh, we, we deliver on this is, is still out there as a question but but personally I, I would think now now is the time the time is right and and as you say and I look to one of these the, the comments from 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 Guido uh, hydrogen is for, uh, for sure a, a great example of, of, of systems integration and and in order to uh, to deliver hydrogen we need renewables we need all the problem, uh, the power to X, uh, and all these uh, very important uh, uh, issues uh, are rising now. So yes, there is a lot of hype around hydrogen. There should be, rightfully so. Uh, and and I think that the, the time is right to uh, to uh, to push for this. And then we have to ensure, obviously, that the demand is there. Uh, we we have to ensure that the applications are are there. And we have to, in my opinion, and politically speaking, ensure that. Uh, that we also simultaneously fulfill our climate ambitions, given uh, the rollout and scale of of, of, uh, of hydrogen. Thank you. Okay, turning to um, um, civil society, let's say, um, uh, Lisa Fisher, your your views um, about uh, hydrogen as part of the sector uh, integration strategy. Do you believe uh, it should play a, a central role? or has the importance of hydrogen in a way been overstated slightly? Yeah, I mean, let me start by saying that, you know, hydrogen has, of course, a always small but critical role to play in our future energy system, that's for sure. I, it has also a small uh, and critical role to play in sector integration, but it's not the one thing that delivers sector integration. As I said, it's much more than technology. It's about uh, defining metrics, institutions, uh, systems. Um, what it does do hydrogen for me is it clearly highlights very critical questions we need to sort out when we talk about energy sector integration. Um, if we do not crack the question on how to put high value resources such as hydrogen to the to where uh, to use where they add most value we are we will be missing out on the benefits of energy system integration we will be missing out on opportunities to deliver a competitive low carbon industrial sector for example so um, just this raises i think hydrogen raises a very important question for energy sector integration it is not the one thing that delivers sector integration we need to uh, get it off the ground uh, to get the energy system of the future, but we also need to make sure it's, it's used in the right place, otherwise we're setting ourselves up for 
for failure, failure that we've seen already with uh, with CCS and biofuels debate, where we've we've blown up expectations, we didn't manage them, we didn't um, create the institutions to, to to check we're actually delivering on our promises. So uh, concretely, uh, Lisa Fisher, does that mean um, what well, prioritizing hydrogen for certain sectors? Um, I know there's been this debate about whether hydrogen should be used at all um, in, in space heating uh, for households. Um, um, you know, there are other sectors of industry where it can obviously make a bigger difference, like for, for the steelmaking sector. Um, it, do you think policymakers should, should prioritize the uses? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and questions of blending hydrogen into the, into the grid, I think um, um, we should we should be challenging uh, fundamentally because that's basically throwing away a, a valuable resource for industry. I think in, uh, in heating, again, I mean, we, we discussed the importance of local planning and, and there should be a degree of sort of local decision making around this, but on a pure um, sort of value add uh, perspective for the energy system, I don't think we should be using hydrogen uh, in heating. We're just artificially in, inflating our energy system. Instead, we should be focusing it on creating a competitive low carbon steel sector, creating a competitive low carbon aviation and shipping industry. And, and we should be clear on that from the start so we know where to invest in terms of infrastructure um, uh, and, and innovation. Paul Voss, uh, maybe views on, on hydrogen and whether you think it should be used in, in, uh, in priority for, for certain sectors and not others. Um, are you, for example, in favor of, of, of using hydrogen at all in, in the building sector? Uh, certainly not directly, no. I'm afraid I'm going to bore everybody by being entirely in agreement with what Lisa's just said. Uh, first of all, on hydrogen, I mean, we, 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 and I think Morton said this too, right? We, we've been here before with this. I remember when I was a trainee, uh, this was, I don't know, 2006, uh, hydrogen was was everywhere and I was busily reading, reading books about it and how it was going to revolutionize our lives. And 15 years later um you know we're not there yet which isn't to say that um that, that it won't happen and I, I hope that it does because i look at the scale of the energy challenge and the urgency of the climate challenge and um i, I think we'll need hydrogen having said that um i believe it's going to be uh, relatively scarce um, because there are obvious limits on how much of it we can produce at least produce it uh, at least produce through um with with renewables and and so i think as lisa said we'll need to be very thoughtful about the way that we use it and the obvious thing to do in such a case from a societal point of view is to allocate it to those applications which we can't deal with by easier means and the ones that jump out at me are kind of heavy transport moving big ships around maybe electro fuels for aviation at some point um, steel production these are areas that are going to need uh, solutions which don't yet exist today i think that residential heat i mean getting our living rooms at 20 degrees and we can do there are easier solutions and it's not just district heating but uh, but also also heat pumps are going to play a really big role and um other renewable heat sources geothermal solar thermal you know district heating networks and heat pumps can help deliver these to our building stock to me the only compelling reason to talk about injecting hydrogen into our grids and heating our homes that way is if your point of departure is we've got to preserve the existing business model of, of gas for domestic heating. From a societal point of view, I just cannot see the, the case for it. And the other thing that worries me a little bit when we have these kinds of discussion about hydrogen is that I think it, 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 it can become uh, a reason for difficult political decisions to be avoided. We can kick down, kick the can down the road and say, well, maybe in 15, 20 years, uh, hydrogen will sort this out. So in the meantime, let's not do anything. You know, I look out my window here in Brussels and I look at the houses and I think, well, they're all burning oil or gas for heat right now. And where's the discussion about how that's going to change? And I think if we allow ourselves to be seduced by this idea that suddenly the gas will turn green and we can heat the buildings that way, um, the result will be that we we are re more reluctant to act than we than we should be. Okay, Jurgen Fischer, um, your views about um, hydrogen and whether you think it should be used in priority sectors um, over uh, others, um, and for example, in heating. Do you believe there's any sense 
in in using hydrogen for for that? No, I think I have to support uh, the other speakers here. I don't think it makes any sense to burn hydrogen. I mean, you know that hydrogen has about a 10% output, uh, energy input output. If you then transport it, uh, maybe in a gas in a gas pipe to a building and burn it, I don't think that's very efficient. Uh, using a heat pump, using the, the electrical energy used to produce hydrogen uh, directly has maybe four or five times the energy efficiency. So why would we do that? I can see it in specific applications, also maybe uh, Heavy, let's name it heavy transport, where this is uh, at the moment difficult to use uh, direct electrical uh, drive trains for the time being, at least uh, because of battery size and and, and load uh, of, of a truck. Um, I think there may be other applications where you need it, and like steel or other uh, industrial applications where hydrogen is better used than just burn, uh, burning oil or gas. But in a, in a, in a heating application, I can only see it in a transition phase where you allow, for example, to install a heat pump and then you need something on top. Um, um, so there is some uh, some products on the market where you have a combined heat pump hydrogen and then you use the existing gas pipe in a building in order not to uh, build a complete new infrastructure. Th that is, But that's for me also a transition uh, to a full electrical heat pump based uh, heating system for buildings. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I think we're getting closer to the end of this uh, virtual conference. Uh, but before we close, um, I'll ask uh, each one of you uh, to say very briefly the, the, the main uh, takeaway message that you would like our viewers uh, to take home with them. And so let me start with you then, Jürgen Fischer. Yeah, uh, my key message is there is so much possible today. Let's use what we can do today and let's uh, yeah, hope that our, our uh, legislative framework and the society framework, uh, people are learning about it, are interested in using it, and then they, it's driven from bottom up. That would be my, my, my biggest wish, that people are interested. And uh, as Paul said correctly, right, why would somebody not want to have a heat pump if it is possible, if somebody is selling it, and if it's easy to install and not five times more expensive. Okay, thank you, Paul Voss. Maybe um, in a nutshell, the main message you'd like our viewers to take home with them. In a nutshell, I, I think we should be excited by this concept of sector integration. We've discussed in some detail now the, the potential that it has to improve things. Um, the next couple of years are going to be very important. We need to enshrine this in, in, in a series of thoughtful legal texts. And if we do that, I think that by 2030, we can already be looking at a, an energy system and a wider economy that are in the middle of a, a fundamental transition to something much better. OK, Lisa Fisher, um, your views to conclude. Yeah. I just highlight an aspect that I think uh, would be worth um, discussing more in the future, which is really the role in, of the consumer and citizen in, in energy system integration, the role of the local, which I think uh, has, very, um, has many implications for also EU governance and for sort of the, the orientation the EU gives to, for cities, municipalities, citizens to develop local plans, and for also um, all consumers being able to access um, and climate neutral solutions, which is really important for the legit legitimacy of the transition. Okay, thanks. Modern Pedersen, uh, your views to conclude? So I think these times are extremely exciting given uh, what's on the table and, and what will be on the table. And, 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 and clearly the discussion shows that we're all impatient. Uh, I think we, we have to bear in mind that what we are doing with sector coupling uh, is also that, that, that we have some legacy systems in, in the various silos that we have to abandon, that uh, we have to cross cut in another way, do things differently than what we've done so far. And, and sector coupling is, is absolutely key in, in, in this regard. So I'd say I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Uh, I fully acknowledge all the inherent difficulties in doing so, but I think these are really exciting times and, and having to look out for sector coupling and identifying all the opportunities in this is, 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 is really great. So uh, let's keep up the speed and ensure that we do this right. Thank you. Okay, and Guido Bertoni, um, you have the privilege of uh, closing with your concluding thoughts. Yes, just 20 seconds, thank you. Uh, I have to pinpoint again the need to 
spread the uh, energy system integration culture across consumers, players, and investors. This is part of, as I said, uh, our empowering, uh, let's say, uh, narrative, which is uh, um, important to, to have the energy system integration implemented, as well as the legislation accordingly. And second, uh, in order to close, I have, that, uh, I have to, to underline that the first uh, possibility to to have this uh, involvement of parties is to participate in our consultation and our workshop we are organizing for all pieces of our legislation. Thank you. Right, uh, thank you. I think this wraps up today's event. Uh, a big thanks to Dan Force for supporting it and thanks to our panelists as well for your time and to our viewers uh, for following us. Uh, in case you like this debate, it will be put online very shortly on YouTube, and you'll be able to view it uh, an entire um, uh, the entire the entire length of it. If you like this event, well, we have a lot more coming up uh, on your active. Just check our website events.youractive.com for more detail. Um, so we hope to see you again soon. Until then, enjoy your day and stay safe. Bye for now.